Hi everyone, this is Peter. Uh, uh, just checking in with you all uh, on the topic of Homer's Odyssey. Um, basically, what I want to talk about with regard to uh, the Odyssey and mythology is uh, there are a number of topics. One of the most important ones, of course, is a, a kind of maybe it's too easy a, a, a place to start, but a comparison or contrast uh, with uh, the Iliad. Um, this is made a little bit more complicated by the fact that we really don't have a clear understanding of, um, you know, who Homer was, if, if Homer was, is another a topic of scholarly controversy. So it's, it's difficult to say, you know, Homer did X in the Iliad and then Y in uh, the Odyssey. But because the two uh, poems, as well as whatever the author Homer actually was, are so central to Greek uh, cultural identity, I think it's definitely important to keep that um, keep that theme constantly in mind and you know see what we can learn in terms of uh, comparing contrasting uh, uh, those two uh, books of poetry. Um, as a foundation, I'm going to use uh, one of the I think particularly good standard uh, textbooks on classical mythology and that's Barry Powell's classical mythology. Um, I've been pretty impressed by this book, uh, relatively straightforward and uh, well argued and um, e you know easy and, and, and straightforward to read as well. Along with, and this is kind of fun, although I might disagree with one or two of these pronunciations, but actual uh, pronunciations are, are helpful as well. I'll, I'll defer to some of those in, in some cases, not in others. Um, so let's spend a little bit of time uh, going through uh, how uh, Barry Powell works uh, with the Odyssey. Well, some things we can take away from that. I might, in a in another lecture um, on the Odyssey, go a little bit more into detail in the into the actual text. But because the poem is so big and because we're moving along pretty briskly, I'm going to probably just confine our discussion to to Powell's remarks and how, what we can do with those. So let's see if we can follow along with with. Um, you know some of these some of these thoughts here. What we can do uh, uh, with that. Um, so the chapter opens up with a quick uh, discussion about precisely the theme I just mentioned, which is differences between the Iliad and the Odyssey. And again, people have been discussing this probably literally for centuries. And one of the things that really makes uh, a major difference with regard to uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey is a couple of themes. One of them right away is the Iliad. Um, versus the Odyssey features something uh, that we could just kind of think of in terms of homecoming. Okay, so homecoming as opposed to the Iliad, which uh, basically when we're in the middle of the action, the Iliad, there's um, the Greeks are certainly nowhere near home, and if we foreshadow, we understand that the Trojans are going to lose their home. Um, we also understand from the Iliad that a number of the actions of the Greeks themselves will prevent uh, let's take a character like Agamemnon or Ajax or Achilles that they will never get home. Um, Odysseus, of course, after numerous uh, travels um, and uh, conflicts and episodes and all the rest of it, does eventually get home. And that's a significant difference between the Iliad and the Odyssey right there. And indeed, the theme of what's known as a nostoi, N-O-S-T-O-I, uh, the word nostoi uh, refers to, and I think Powell mentions this elsewhere in the chapter, a basic, a basically a literary tradition that focuses precisely on homecoming uh, after uh, the Trojan War, kind of aftermath. And that's a theme we'll, we'll pick up in, in just a minute or two. Another interesting aspect of the Odyssey that uh, certainly um, occupies people's uh, minds and grabs their attention is the presence of women. Um, whether it's uh, divine characters, Athena immediately springs to mind as the protector of Odysseus. Um, Calypso or Circe uh, as uh, influences in various ways on Odysseus's life. Or um, characters uh, such as, of course, most famously Penelope, but also uh, Nausicaa. Um, whether human or divine, female characters play a much more prominent role in the Odyssey than they uh, do at all uh, in the Iliad. And, uh, I do like the uh, proposal in, that Powell mentions here that the author 
of um, uh, the Odyssey was, uh, you know, was a woman. Uh, some people have quipped that it would have been Homer's daughter, which I think is, is kind of an interesting thought. Um, again, other contrasts that emerge uh, that are worth pointing out that Powell brings in. One of the critical ones is in terms of scene. So in the Iliad, as Powell points out, the, the Greeks are basically jammed between the devil and the deep blue sea, to take that uh, famous nautical saying. They are trying to take over Troy, but they um, are basically trapped on the beach. It would be like the Americans, you know, in World War II, on D-Day, being stuck on the beach in Normandy and not quite able to, um, you know, make any headway inland. Um, and they're also cognizant of the potential dangers uh, of the ocean behind them. So it's it's a tight and confined kind of place that only opens out occasionally to the battlefield, uh, which is really kind of, uh, again, I think raises a kind of level of conflict and anxiety uh, in that poem. In the Odyssey, on the other hand, uh, the settings range widely, um, whether it's Ithaca um, or Boy, all all over the place. I mean, it, that's literally. I mean, the, the word Odyssey um, uh, has become you know synonymous with a wide ranging journey, and it is not merely um, human mundane geographical destinations, but also the underworld. One of the most famous episodes in the Odyssey, Odysseus uh, visits uh, the underworld. So it's a pretty spectacular kind of uh, geographical. Uh, exploration and exploration and curiosity is certainly at the heart of the um, the Odyssey. Another thing that's important, uh, which Powell brings up, is the structure. Um, basically, in the Iliad, it's a pretty straightforwardish uh, narrative um, of I think maybe Powell has the specifics, but I want to say roughly a month or so. Um, Basically, the episode where Achilles uh, decides uh, to withdraw his support for the Greek um, uh, effort uh, after he uh, perceives his disrespect at the hands of Agamemnon. Um, and we sort of, are, again, are plunged right into the middle of it, and all the important characters are pretty much brought into play right away. And we kind of understand where we're at. In the Odyssey, it's actually really quite um, different. Uh, as Powell points out, it's, it's a really important thing to remember about the Odyssey. Odysseus himself doesn't appear until Book 5. Now, why is that significant? It means that everybody is kind of wondering where he is. Okay, Is he still alive? If he's still alive, what's he doing? Where is his location at? Um, and this kind of raises a bunch of interesting dramatic complications. So, for instance, because of his long absence, there are a number of locals, local young men on the island of Ithaca, who would love nothing more than to take possession of his wife and his property. Um, and then that brings into a play uh, the character Odysseus's son, Telemachus. And Telemachus, uh, speaking of complicated characters, you know, Telemachus is right the son of... Odysseus and has a kind of difficult and dramatically interesting challenge, which is to, you know, find out if his father is still alive, find out what his father's going to do, and then find out what he's going to do as an individual um, to respond to those challenges. So there's a great deal of complexity um, uh, in, in that absence of Odysseus uh, that the poet, whoever it is, certainly takes um, uh, advantage of, let's put it that way. Um, although uh, uh, the specific technical time in the poem is, uh, uh, the Powell mentioned six weeks, the actual time that's kind of covered in terms of all of the events and all of uh, the travels of Odysseus is basically about 10 years. So there's this interesting kind of telescoping, near and far geographically and near and far uh, chronologically, that um, really kind of makes this poem far more complicated, far more interesting in many ways, uh, in terms of its structure than uh, you know than something like uh, uh, the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad definitely makes reference to 
other places and other times, but um, it doesn't have that sort of strangely cinematic quality um, that uh, the Odyssey has as it as it moves easily in and out of, you know, whether it could be the local scene in in uh, Odysseus's uh, palace in Ithaca or uh, any number of other uh, locations, you know, Sparta or heaven knows where else, Troy. Um, what else shows up in this that Paul is going to talk a little bit about that's worth remembering? Um, Demodocus is kind of an interesting character because you have this sense of a self-reflective aspect, which is to say the poet, the singer, the bard, um, in essence has uh, portrayed himself and the complexities of being a bard, if that makes sense. So that you have this kind of, um, you know, looking at the poet, looking at himself in the mirror, so to speak, as he's doing him, as he's doing his thing. And, um, you know, we consider the kind of complexities uh, of that, um, you know, that aspect of, of art making in general. Basically, the poet is calling attention to what it's like to be a poet. And as Powell points out, and I think rightly so, talks a little bit about how Demodocus kind of, as a, as a bard, brings certain critical episodes to life. Um, so uh, it's a good, good point, for instance, Demodocus sings of the Trojan horse at, at the palace of Alcinous and the Phaeacians. Um, Odysseus is an anonymous stranger, but this is kind of an interesting double twist. He reveals himself. Okay, and then that, of course, is what the poet in many ways uh, does. And that revelation is ultimately what propels him home. And the quest, I think, and this is a theme that will touch upon a little bit, the quest for self-identity, understanding oneself, is certainly, uh, let's move into the next section, is something that sets Odysseus very far apart from Achilles. Um... The section on a different kind of hero in Powell, I think, is pretty compelling stuff. Um, the when you think about Achilles in the Iliad and the quest for Arete, A R E T E, and the Kleos that comes along with that, Achilles seems to be, you know, the guy. He seems to be the individual who displays the fighting skills that and the sort of physical prowess and the and the arrogance and the sheer um what's the right word i mean if we think about virtue as the greeks understood it arete he's the one who's the sort of culmination of all the characteristics of a successful greek warrior however odysseus even in the iliad stands apart from achilles in this important regard and that is to say that he thinks and he speaks in a far more sophisticated fashion He's able to change, and in fact, that's one of the characteristics of the opening lines of the poem. The, the man, sometimes described as a man of many turns or changes, that he's able to adjust to circumstances and make, um, make himself fit into the situation. Um, this is kind of an interesting, um, an interesting uh, problem for... Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey to solve, which is what happens when standard kind of physical, brutal strength is no longer enough. It's his, Odysseus's trick that opens up the gates using the Trojan horse. Um, his ability to speak uh, saves his life when he washes up on the beach in Phaeacia and encounters the teenage uh, girl, uh, Nausicaa. So it's a, a really kind of a a major change, not just from Achilles to Odysseus, but also from old Greece, heroic Greece, to a kind of new uh, understanding of Greece. Again, uh, the Powell puts it here, the ability to exercise foresight, discretion, and self-control. Those are not heroic um, characteristics, according to the Iliad, but because of the need, the real need on the part of Odysseus to exercise these skills, it's pretty clear that he's setting a new template for uh, male arete. And interestingly enough, and maybe I'll explore this in the, another uh, talk, interestingly enough, it's women who provide the uh, guidance in that regard.